Good morning. Welcome to our Friday morning briefing here at the 229th meeting of the American Astronomical Society at the Gaylord Texan in Grapevine, Texas. I'm Rick Feinberg. I'm the AAS press officer. And helping me out today are my two deputy press officers. Inga Heyer is in the back. She's monitoring our webcast and will be relaying questions from our uh, off-site listeners. And Larry Marshall will be manning the microphone during the Q&A. Please silence your cell phones, pagers, beepers, etc., so they don't go off during the press conference. Um, if you're on the AAS press list, uh, you'll be getting a press release uh, in your inbox. It should be there by the time you get back from the briefing. So in case this is your first press conference at the AAS, let me uh, just briefly tell you how it works. I'm going to introduce the topic and the speakers, and then we'll start on the left, go to the right. When they're finished, we'll do the Q&A at the end. So the uh, topic this morning is stars and interstellar space, and we have four presentations. The first will be given by Julia Zachary from Wesleyan University. She'll be talking about measuring the local interstellar medium with Hubble and the Voyager spacecraft. Then we'll hear about a precise prediction of a stellar merger and a red nova outburst from Larry Molnar at Calvin College. I'm especially happy to have Larry on a press panel because he and I went to grad school together. Next will be Walid Majid from the Jet Propulsion Lab. He'll talk about post-outburst radio monitoring of a high magnetic field pulsar. And then the fourth presentation, which you might wonder, why is it in stars and interstellar space? It's light pollution solutions communities can use by Lori Allen from the National Optical Astronomy Observatory. Well, you could say it's a stretch, but if you know me, you know that I stretch sometimes. Uh, you can't see stars if there's too much light pollution. So we need to do something about light pollution if we're going to have future press conferences about stars in interstellar space. Does that work? Yes. Good. OK. So I will now turn it over to Julia Zachary, and we'll get underway. Thank you, Rick. Good morning, and uh, thanks for coming out on this cold Dallas day. Uh, uh, I'm Julia Zachary, obviously. Uh, I'm here to talk to you about measuring the local ISM along the sight lines of the two Voyager spacecraft with the Hubble Space Telescope's Space Telescope Imaging Spectrograph. Uh, I am an undergraduate from Wesleyan University. I'm a senior studying astronomy and physics. I'm doing my senior thesis with Seth Redfield. And our third collaborator, who unfortunately couldn't make it today, is Jeff Linsky from JILA at the University of Colorado. If you're interested, I'll have a poster. It's already up. Uh, it's poster number 340.34. I'm going to start off with uh, kind of some background on the interstellar medium. Uh, as you can see in this, from this image on the left, uh, it looks like in our local neighborhood, there's a big blob of stuff. Those are, that's actually a bunch of different uh, interstellar medium clouds of gas and dust. And the blue arrows in the figure indicate the directions and the speeds with which these clouds are moving relative to the sun, which is the uh, bright yellow star right in the middle of the figure. So the interstellar medium then is essentially the space between us and other stars filled with these, these clouds, these interstellar medium clouds. Another important thing to note before I continue is uh, the definition of the heliosphere, which is essentially formed from the interaction of the outward moving solar wind and the inward pressure of the interstellar medium. What's really interesting about this is that we know that the Voyager spacecraft are and have moved through the heliosphere and are entering interstellar space. So while 20 light years relative to the size of our galaxy doesn't seem like very much, uh, it's actually quite a large difference, uh, distance uh, with respect to, for, say, our solar system. So what's the big picture here? We've obtained two unique measurements from Hubble 
And we ha also have data from the Voyager spacecraft, though they are old, they're, they're not that old, they're only 40. Um, <laughs> It's old for a spacecraft, let's put it that way. Uh, five of their 10-ish instruments are still functioning and taking measurements actively, which is really great for us because we're able to uh, compare these measurements with our data from Hubble. So an analogy we like to use is that of uh, Google Maps. So everyone knows what Google Maps is, right? Uh, if the Voyager spacecraft are the Google Maps car going around your neighborhood taking pictures, giving you the street view, then Hubble is providing the overview, the road map for the Voyagers on their road trip through interstellar space. Uh, an important connection to make, and some of you might know about this, is that with the announcement of Breakthrough Starshot, a, uh, a potential interstellar mission to uh, our nearest uh, nearby star, Alpha Centauri, we're now, for the first time, really considering interstellar missions uh, in real life, not just sci-fi anymore. So uh, this is a, just a kind of a basic graphic of, uh, to give you some better context than just me doing hand-wavy stuff. Uh, so you can see the solar system on the left-hand side, starting with the sun. The scale on the bottom represents distance in light travel time. So you see eight light minutes at Earth, 19 light hours at the Voyager spacecraft, and 19 light years at our target stars, which are indicated on the far right-hand side by the yellow text and arrows. This distance scale is logarithmic, hence why it increases so much over such a short space. Um, what's important to note here is that our target stars uh, are within 15 degrees of the direct line of sight of the, both Voyager spacecraft, and that there are stars that may be closer to us, for example, Alpha Centauri, but it does not fall along this line of sight, and that's what was important for making our measurements and choosing our target stars. So it does look like uh, Voyager 2 is still inside the solar system, inside the uh, orange line, which is the heliopause, the boundary of the heliosphere, it's possible that it may be in interstellar space very soon, which is very exciting. We'll have two spacecraft in interstellar space. So what, what did I do? What did we do? What's the point? Um, these are our spectra from Hubble. Uh, on the left is uh, magnesium, and on the right is carbon and its excited state. We have a, a good inventory of spectra uh, of different, uh, a bunch of different elements from the periodic table. The magnesium spectrum shows, uh, shows us that we see at least one, probably two ISM clouds that are blocking the light from the stars coming to us. We should see what is indicated by the gold line, which is uh, the, the shape of the missing stellar emission, but what we actually see is the, indicated in black as the observed data and red as modeled, uh, and that indicates that we see these something that's blocking our light. And that's good for us to figure out kind of the structure of the interstellar medium. What clouds do we see? How many of them? What's their composition? And getting towards a composition uh, perspective and connecting to Voyager, with the carbon measurements, we can take uh, the values from those spectra, and we can derive an actual value for the uh, electron density or density of the material in these clouds. And that's something that Voyager, both Voyagers are doing and still doing and will do for another at least five-ish years, whenever they die. Um, and we are able to compare those two measurements, which is very exciting. We find that um, one of our measurements for one cloud is comparable to that measured by Voyager. And uh, the value for our second cloud we think is there is slightly higher, which is pretty cool. We think that Voyager is now moving into a very rich and complex interstellar environment. Um, just to wrap it up, since I am running short on time, we have high-resolution spectra from the Hubble Space Telescope and are able to measure properties of the interstellar medium along the sight lines of the Voyager spacecraft. We are thus able to connect two of NASA's highly successful and long-lasting missions. 
The ISM through which the voyagers will, are traveling is a rich and complex environment, like I said before. It is one in which we see evidence for multiple ISM clouds of gas and dust. We also measure electron density, and we find values comparable to those measured by Voyager for the two ISM clouds that we observe. Thank you very much, and I will turn it over to Larry. Just reset it. Uh, no. Reset. <laughs> good. Oh, all right. So, good morning. I'm Larry Molnar, and uh, in my presentation today, I have two of the elements that to me make science exciting. A very specific prediction that can be tested and a big explosion. <laughs> the particular question I'm asking is, what is the fate of contact binary stars? See, my cursor works over there. You can see in the upper right corner, uh, contact binary stars are two stars that are so close to each other that they basically share a common atmosphere. And it's generally thought that eventually they must merge but how does that happen? Have we seen that happen? Not so clear. The second question today is what is a red nova? Turns out to be related to the first question. The uh, lower right shows a picture of a light echo from a red nova that uh, was done by the Hubble telescope uh, a number of years back. The connection between these two uh, questions came up with the explosion in 2008 of a red nova named V1309 SCO. By looking at archival data taken before that explosion, astronomers were able to find the distinctive light curve of a binary star. As a binary star orbits around, it gets brighter and fainter as it mutually eclipses. And that V1309 SCO was doing that before the explosion. It isn't doing that today. That's the smoking gun of a uh, merging star. But more than that, we could actually see in those data that the period of the star was getting shorter over time. Shorter period means it's spiraling in, and it was getting shorter at an ever accelerating rate. And to me, that's the Rosetta Stone I want to use to find the next one before it explodes. Now, how do we do this? We've got to find a star that's got a period getting shorter and getting shorter at an ever accelerating rate. This is the topic of time domain astronomy. And this is the one place where the small telescopes have the advantage. Fortunately, I have a small telescope. This is the uh, Calvin College Observatory. We're in Michigan, but our students in Michigan operate this uh, out in uh, northwest New Mexico, where the sky is still uh, dark. And uh, we have already taken over 170 nights of data on this uh, object with this telescope. I don't think that would have been possible with other uh, telescope allotment committees. Our target is a star KIC9832227, hereafter our star, uh, that came to our attention uh, when a student of mine, Dan Van Nord, heard a talk about Kepler spacecraft data of this star and went home and determined the orbital period of it from those Kepler data. And then he downloaded archival data from this star going way back to 1999 and determined orbital periods from those data and got a different answer. He saw that the orbital period was getting shorter. Maybe this is a good target. We followed it for two years and got the graph that you see here. Now, I've got to say for a moment, how do we read this graph? Our time is going from 1999 all the way to 2014. And when we see the data going up, we're seeing a period that's slightly longer as it gets Level there, the period is getting shorter. As it begins to go down, the slope is telling us about the period. We're seeing the densely sampled Kepler spacecraft data where the period was distinctly shorter than before. And then here are the two years of follow-up we did, uh, the open circles, where it's getting shorter still. We fit a line through this using the specific formula that worked for that explosion in 2008, the dashed line here, and we were very pleasantly surprised that it fits. 
This is not a model that has many degrees of freedom. It either fits or it doesn't, and it did. But in 2015, while we presented this to the scientific community, we did not yet consider this a highly likely thing. Will the star continue to follow the extrapolation of this line, getting steeper, going all the way down? And are there other ways to interpret what's going on? As you look at the right side of the graph, you can see what we're really measuring is the time of the eclipses, and they're coming about a half hour early now compared to what they would have been uh, with the uh, period from the early, uh, early observations. So we worked real hard in the last two years to answer those questions, and in the next slide we'll see up to uh, the current date what's happened with the same dashed line from our presentation in 2015. All those purple points on the lower right fall very nicely on our dashed line, consistent with our prediction up to now, and it means the rate of change of the orbital period. It's been getting faster, but it's now getting faster at a greater rate, is now superlative. It's going faster, the rate of change, than any other uh, contact binary system. If we uh, refine our model with those newer data, we get a predicted explosion date of 2022, give or take a year. But what about alternatives? Well, it is possible. Uh, well, we mentioned the uh, time delay it takes for light to get somewhere. If this binary is orbiting some distant companion, and over the course of those same 15 years, it was coming towards us, that could give us the extra half hour. So we've looked with two large uh, uh, telescopes at spectra extensively to find is there a third star there that could be uh, setting us uh, a, a false flag basically here. And it turns out that uh, what we see is only the two stars. Here moving very rapidly, this is velocity versus uh, brightness. You can see they're going hundreds of kilometers per second in order to make a full circuit in 11 hours. So the alternative models are out, the timing is following what we said two years ago, and the data from these spectra together with our light curves can be used to really draw a picture uh, of our star system here. So let me introduce our star system by the details. 1,800 light years away, only three times the radius of the sun to go from one center of the star to the other. Um, the temperature, about the same temperature as our own sun, the mass is one about 40% larger, one about a third the size of our sun. The orbit is tilted so that we only get a partial eclipse, so it's tilted by 53 degrees, and the brightness is 12th magnitude. What does that imply for this explosion if the explosion occurs? Well, it will take about six months, if it does it like the explosion in uh, 2008, to rise to its full brightness. That brightness will be 10,000 times greater than the original which means it'll be second magnitude at the peak and it will remain at the peak for several months. You're familiar with the Northern Cross asterism. It'll be just one more star in the crossbar of the Northern Cross, about the same brightness as the other ones. So a very dramatic change in the sky as anyone can see it. You won't need a telescope to tell me in 2023 whether I was wrong or whether I was right. <laughs> This is the constellation of Cygnus. Cygnus is the swan. If you squint real well, you can actually see the swan shape there as well. It's a wonderful place to have this happen uh, in that it's high in the sky in the early evening, uh, in the summer, and in the fall. And if you're willing to get up in the morning, you can at least see it a little bit throughout the year. So when this thing occurs, if it occurs, we will not miss it. So what's our current status? This is the first ever prediction of an explosion. We don't know yet if it's right or wrong, but it's the first time we can actually make such a prediction. The timing from the next two years, because our prediction becomes ever more stark, we expect the period change to go ever more rapidly, will tell us for sure one way or the other. But right now, it's giving us a unique opportunity to really establish what causes the contact binaries to merge. What is the mechanism behind how the nova explodes? And so we are starting now, even before we're 100% sure, to broaden our study to other wavelengths. We'll soon be making measurements in the radio, infrared, and x-ray. So keep an eye on this. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> 
Good morning. Um, I am, uh, my name is Walid Majid. I'm from JPL. Um, so I'm here uh, this morning to uh, uh, talk to you about a really remarkable uh, pulsar uh, that we have uh, started to follow up. Uh, we think this is a missing link a neutron star between two families of uh, neutron stars, uh, rotation power pulsars and magnetars. Um, and it sort of has a double personality and we've been fortunate to um, have a chance to uh, study this uh, recently. So um, I'm going to start up by um, just telling you briefly what a pulsar is. Um, so pulsars are rotating neutron stars. Uh, neutron stars are uh, remnants of um, um, explosions of uh, very massive stars. Um, the outer layers get shut out and then what's left is this extraordinary object, uh, very compact, the mass, of, the mass of it is between one and a half to twice the mass of the sun. However, the size of it is more like the uh, size of a modern city, uh, say 10, 20 kilometers. Um, so <clears throat> the density is just extraordinary. Uh, it's essentially nuclear, it's denser than nuclear matter. Um, two, uh, two of the properties of pulsars that are um, remarkable and uh, have been studied over uh, several decades now uh, is the, the rotation of these pulsars. Uh, so as the star collapses, just like a figure skater bringing in the arms in, the angular momentum, the spin of the star uh, goes very, very uh, fast. So um, pulsars have been detected with spin periods between in the range of few milliseconds all the way to a few seconds. Um, and also the magnetic fields are just enormous. So uh, they range in the um, 10 to the 10 all the way to 10 to the 15 gauss. And to put that in, per, in perspective, the uh, magnetic field of Earth on the surface of Earth is about one Gauss. Uh, so one of these refrigerator magnets on, uh, is typically about 100 Gauss. Uh, these objects are in the 10 to the 9, 10 to the 10, all the way 10 to the 15 times uh, stronger magnetic fields. And so <clears throat> what happens is that um, this magnetic field uh, uh, has a, an axis that's misaligned with the rotation axis. And so every time that axis, the magnetic axis, passes by our line of sight, we see a blip or a pulse. And that's why it's called a pulsar. So in the figure on the bottom left, um, that shows individual single pulses. Unfortunately, we don't, uh, we don't see that in, in most of the pulsars because they're very far away and the emission is very faint. Um, so <clears throat> there is a technique that pulsar astronomers use, which is once you know the period of the pulsar, then we can fold that data and then provide what's called a pulse profile. And these pulse profiles are kind of a signature of the pulsar, and they typically don't change. And they're very stable. Um, and in this case, I'll show you that uh, this pulsar has been changing on a kind of a weekly basis. Um, so just a quick... Uh, um, description of, uh, so this figure on the, on the right shows the census of uh, all the known pulsars to date. So we, we have about uh, 2,500 uh, pulsars that have been detected, mostly in our own galaxy. Um, so this uh, figure shows the period versus the change in the period. And you can see that the, most of the, the population is on the top right. Uh, these are canonical normal pulsars. Uh, there's a population in the very left corner. These are called millisecond pulsars, some of the world's best clocks. Um, and the population in the very top right corner is called, uh, these are referred to as magnetars. So these, uh, the, most of the pulsars are powered by rotation spin down of, uh, of these objects. As they spin down, as they slow down, they emit this radiation across a broad band of electromagnetic spectrum, and that's what we detect. However, uh, we, we have a handful of pulsars that show emission that are even brighter than what can be accounted for from the spin down. And um, people have, astronomers have uh, um, <clears throat> dubbed these uh, magnetars because we think that these are actually powered not by spin down, but by the magnetic field decay of these neutron stars. Uh, so that's a population in the very top right. And for, uh, for a long time, um, there's this uh, question of are they related to the normal pulsars? And I think this class that uh, this uh, star, the red star, uh, kind of a lone star here, uh, 
uh, is the Pulsar J1119, which I will be describing, and this is kind of a missing link object uh, that could, uh, that sometimes behave as a normal radio pulsars and sometimes behaves as a, as a magnetar. So just a, a word uh, or two about uh, this pulsar. It, it was detected in a pulsar survey in, in 2000 using the Parkes uh, Radio Telescope in Australia. Uh, really, it's an ordinary pulsar. The spin period is about half a second. Um, the magnetic field is quite high. And here on the uh, bottom left is the pulse profile, that signature of this pulsar. Um, the image on the right is actually an X-ray image um, taken by XMM Newton. Uh, uh, space uh, X-ray telescope, uh, and actually shows the supernova shell within which this object is sitting. So, in uh, towards the end of July of this year, uh, the uh, two telescopes, the Fermi uh, Gamma Ray Burst Monitor and the Swift uh, um, Bat uh, Telescope, these are the monitors, all sky monitors in space. Uh, they detected a very short X-ray burst. Uh, so I have an example of this uh, from a recent paper on the bottom. Um, very short X-ray burst from this pulsar was detected. Subsequently, the New Star telescope was pointed at it. Uh, the Swift X XRT also uh, detected pulsations from this source. Um, and uh, also, the group uh, at McGill University uh, were able to detect a glitch or a kind of a star quake. Uh, from this uh, pulsar. Um, our colleague, uh, Professor Vicky Caspi Ka uh, at uh, McGill University uh, was involved and was leading this work and uh, contacted us uh, to have a look uh, at this object uh, using our uh, radio telescope. And the reason I think she contacted us is because we have uh, the world's uh, largest radio telescope in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, as part of the Deep Space Network, uh, uh, it was mentioned uh, for Voyager. Uh, the data from Voyager is actually collected by these uh, um, 70 meter diameter telescopes uh, that is at each of the Deep Space Network sites. Really extraordinary instrument. Uh, it was built in the, in the 60s and I, it's, it's just uh, an incredibly sensitive system. Uh, recently, we have uh, put the instrumentation on this uh, telescope to detect pulsars, uh, specifically to detect millisecond pulsars at the center of the galaxy. Uh, so what we're trying to do is uh, search for the holy grail of what's in pulsar astronomy. One of the holy grails is detecting uh, pulsar in orbit with a black hole. And so we have actually designed the system to do that search, but it can also do a lot of other uh, neat things as I'll describe uh, uh, in a bit. Um, so we um, pointed this uh, telescope at this object and uh, we didn't see anything. So we, uh, uh, despite its sensitivity, apparently the radio emission from this pulsar, uh, which was on all the time before this X-ray outburst, was completely shut, uh, shut off. Uh, so that itself is, is extraordinary. Uh, <clears throat> a couple of weeks later, we uh, had a look at this object again. And uh, to our surprise, the pulse uh, emission, the radio emission that was turned back on, but it was turned on, uh, the, so these figures show two different days at two different frequencies. Um, and you can see that not only it was turned on and it was very bright, but it also, the pulse profile or the signature of the pulsar had changed. And in fact, it was changing, so these two observations were made on a bit, about a week apart. Uh, it was changing on a weekly kind of basis. Um, the system that we have uh, in Australia, in fact, is so uh, sensitive that we were even able to detect individual single pulses from this pulsar. And again, these figures, particularly the one on the right, you can see individual pulses from this pulsar on two of these uh, subsequent days. Um, so something extraordinary has happened to this uh, object, and uh, the, the radio beam has turned back on, but there is uh, a lot of evolution in the, in the beam of this, uh, of this pulsar. And so we are now actually uh, carrying out a monitoring program. Sort of every two weeks, we look at this object, and we are surprised that every time we look at this, the pulse profile is changing. So um, these high energy outbursts in X-ray has set off something in the pulsar that is now uh, changing the pulse profile of the, of the pulsar. And also this figure on the left shows that the pulse period is changing as well. 
Um, <clears throat> so um, I'm uh, basically this this object is um, I mean it's a no normally in uh, rotation part pulsar in its normal state, um, um, but it seems to also show clear magnetar-like uh, behavior, uh, which is why we think this is. Uh, kind of a missing link object between these two classes of uh, pulsars. Um, so our ongoing uh, monitoring program is actually continuing right now. I'm putting up our list of collaborators, uh, but um, I also want to point out that uh, very recently we had coordinated observations with uh, three X-ray telescopes uh, to try to understand this uh, system better, and hopefully uh, the next AAS will have some results uh, uh, from these observations. Thank you. I did. It didn't come up. Oh, now it's coming up. Okay. Well, good morning. My name is Lori Allen. I'm the director of Kitt Peak National Observatory. Kitt Peak is uh, located about 50 miles west of Tucson on the Tohono O'odham Reservation in Arizona. And um, we've been providing telescopes and data for astronomers for almost 60 years now. And I want to talk to you about uh, a, a major recent development in the protection of dark skies. And so here we go. So here's a recent map of the artificial night sky brightness over the United States. As you can see, uh, most of the American population lives under light polluted skies and uh, the uh, level of brightness uh, is, can be as much as 40 times higher than the natural sky brightness uh, in our cities uh, in particular. The result of all of this is that most Americans never experience a starry night sky. Most Americans never experience a starry night sky, and uh, we would like to change that. This problem is, in fact, getting worse, uh, and the reason it's getting worse is because we're uh, in the midst of an LED revolution, and that is um, uh, that outdoor lighting from street lights to uh, Advertising signs uh, are all uh, now being replaced uh, at a very rapid pace by uh, broad spectrum LEDs. These so-called white light uh, LEDs are uh, bad for a number of reasons. Uh, the broad spectrum LEDs that are quite common, and these are LEDs which will have a correlated color temperature on their packaging of 3000 K or higher. Uh, these are bad for a number of reasons. Uh, primarily, they're bad because they have a very strong component of very blue light. And uh, blue light is the light that produces so much glare uh, when you look at an overlit intersection as you're approaching it at night, or modern, very blue car headlights. Uh, we've all experienced uh, extreme discomfort and temporary blindness uh, from those. Um, so uh, they produce a very bad glare, which actually makes lighting, which makes it you know, less possible to see uh, what's going on and, and, and is, is less safe. Uh, there's been uh, evidence for many years, it's very well established that uh, the blue light has a, a bad effect on wildlife. Uh, everything from insects to the migratory patterns of birds to uh, bats who actually perform a lot of the pollination uh, in, in our ecosystem uh, and to turtles uh, whose nesting sites are disturbed. Um, and now, uh, this year, the American Medical Association uh, released a study um, about the impact of blue light on the health of humans. And so it, it is time to start paying attention to this. 
And lastly, of course, blue light is bad for astronomy. Why is that? Well, for the same reason that the daytime sky is blue. The blue light scatters more effectively into our atmosphere, and that pollutes the entire night sky and uh, makes it harder for us to see faint objects that we study in the universe. Uh, even in areas that have been historically protected, like, the, like Arizona, where we have many research observatories, um, even in, in areas like this where we've been able to keep the sky dark, we are under threat. These, these skies are also under threat uh, because of the very rapid proliferation of the broad spectrum LEDs. The good news is that the same technology that is causing these problems also provides very simple and extremely effective solutions. And I want to talk to you about those solutions today. The first one, super simple, shield the light. Don't let the light go upwards, don't let the light go outwards. Direct the light downwards, which is where it's needed. Light the areas you need to light, don't light everything else in the environment. That's very easy to do. Uh, shielded fixtures are available. It's, uh, it, it, this is not a hard fix. Uh, secondly, we can dim the light. The, we don't have to have extremely bright light for every outdoor application. We don't have to have light 24 hours a day for most outdoor applications. Consider turning down the brightness of your outdoor lights. Consider putting your lights on a motion detector system so they only come on when they're needed. And of course, consider turning your lights off uh, uh, at night uh, when you're not outside using, uh, using them. Uh, I, I use an analogy in Arizona that people get immediately, which is you wouldn't turn on your, your, your garden hose and let it run all night, right? I mean, we're wasting money uh, as well as degrading the environment by leaving lights on when we don't need them. And finally, it's important to use the right color of light. And this is the correlated color temperature that I was mentioning earlier. Uh, I've, I've illustrated so various color temperature lighting there, I think we can all agree that aesthetically, the high color temperature light on the left, which is very blue, is not the kind of light we want to be surrounded by, whereas the warmer light on the right at 3000 K is quite pleasant and quite comfortable to the human eye. And if you are in doubt about the color temperature of a fixture or the shielding capability of a fixture or, or any other property of, of that lighting, um, I recommend that you consult the International Dark Sky Association. They uh, now put a, a seal of approval on fixtures that meet these requirements. And if you go to your local hardware store and fixtures with this seal are not available, ask them to get them for you. Uh, if there is a demand, your local retailers will provide them for you. And so uh, this is a, a, a great resource if you, if you want to upgrade your outdoor lighting. And when in doubt, just try to remember that eye-friendly light is usually sky-friendly light as well. And so you can let your own uh, reaction to the light be a guide. So I want to um, share with you some recent and not so recent success stories uh, that um, illustrate ways in which we can all engage with this issue and make significant progress. Uh, first of all, historically, Flagstaff and Tucson have led the way with the first outdoor lighting codes uh, that were ever drawn up. Uh, the first one actually uh, was in Flagstaff in 1958. Dark skies are now such a deeply embedded part of the culture in Flagstaff that you can purchase dark sky coffee at the local coffee shop or a dark sky ale at the local brew pub. And um, this is wonderful. They've kept that culture going uh, all of these years. Uh, more recently, in fact, just this year, in the city of Phoenix, uh, where a conversion project was started to convert all the high pressure and low pressure sodium street lights to LED lights. Uh, rather than going with the 
uh, sort of default 4000K very blue LEDs, the city of Phoenix elected to replace their 100,000 streetlights with 2700K LEDs. These have an even warmer appearance than the 3000K that I showed you in the previous slide. This was completely a citizen-led effort uh, led by uh, members of the Phoenix chapter of the International Dark Sky Association, and it illustrates exactly how ordinary citizens can get involved in this and steer their city planners in the right direction. And uh, finally, another example that is uh, work that is going on right now is a collaboration between Palomar Observatory in Southern California and a, a, a governing group, the Western Riverside um, Council of Governments, which covers 16 different municipalities in Southern California. They are working together, deploying uh, light fixtures of different kinds uh, in streetlights and elsewhere in those municipalities, and soliciting citizen feedback for what lighting solutions people feel works the best for their environment. This is a fantastic process because it gets the, uh, the communities involved and they therefore get to share in the success of, of the work. And I'll just very quickly show you, I'm not going to read this, that just this week the American Astronomical Society passed a resolution uh, endorsing such efforts and encouraging uh, all astronomers to get involved in this and do these three things that I just described to you. Shielding, uh, 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 brightness control, and color control. But you don't have to be an astronomer to get engaged in your local community and in fact to lead the effort to m keep your skies dark or make your skies darker or prevent your skies from getting brighter. Uh, what can all of us do? Well, as I have said, shield, dim the lights, select warm color, provide your input to planners and developers. It is absolutely critical that you get in touch with your local planners Find out what is being planned for streetlight conversion, for instance, in your community. And if the plan is to install 4,000K uh, CCT streetlight uh, uh, LEDs in the streetlights, you can steer your planners towards the lower uh, CCT, the warmer color temperatures, 3,000K and below. It's, it's not a difficult process. A lot of times they don't even know that these alternatives exist, and uh, I believe that your neighbors and friends uh, at home will thank you if you're able to do this because you will be improving the uh, appearance of the outdoor environment. Uh, this is the time. Uh, Streetlights in all major cities will all be replaced within the next few years. So this is really the time to do this work. and. Um, in addition to that, uh, LED advertising signs are also proliferating, and so, um, again, now is the time. So, um, bad news, sky is getting brighter, sky may get brighter more rapidly if we, if we don't uh, steer our planners in the right direction. The good news is that the technological solutions to solve this already exist and are completely within our hands to do so. And it is totally up to us whether or not we leave our children a better sky than we have. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. We're gonna to go to the Q&A now. Um, if you have a question, please raise your hand. Larry will bring you the microphone, and then you can identify yourself and tell us who you want to ask your question of. So we'll start here in the room, and then we'll go to the webcast. Questions here? Got one down here in front with Camille. Camille Carlisle, Sky and Telescope. I have two questions for Dr. Molnar. Um, first of all, this is in Cygnus. Are you going to have a pro-am campaign? And this is like prime amateur collaboration territory. Second question, 
In the paper, you depended quite heavily on V1309 SCO and Thailand's analysis. Have you written this by him? Like, does he have thoughts about this or other folks that have worked on this? Um, yes, thanks. Um, Pro-Am, definitely. <laughs> uh, we haven't begun that yet. It's really a very much of an evolving project in the sense of when we first started this, it just seemed unlikely and not worth bothering others yet. And then uh, with each year's data, we get more sure and we're trying to scale up what we're doing. Um, so, but this is the year that we really need to begin to reach out and that's what I'm beginning with uh, today. Uh, it's an excellent opportunity for amateurs because their telescopes are as powerful as mine, really. And we're planning, for example, to put together a web page where an amateur can make a light curve with their telescope and simply paste the data from that light curve into the web page, and it will do the calculations to say, uh, how does that compare with our prediction? Is it ahead of prediction or behind? Of course, our prediction is just the prediction. Their data is the right answer, so they'll be able to check for themselves. Um, as far as uh, the, the prototype, yes, it, the V1309 SCO, uh, the great discovery was made there by Raul, Ramold uh, Talenda, a Polish astronomer, and uh, we have uh, been in contact with him from the beginning just to let him know what uh, we're doing, and um, I think he's excited about it. I think his discovery of those data is really a watershed for this field, and I'm really glad to be able to follow that up. There was another question right behind Camille, I think. Tell us who you are and who you're asking your question of. Uh, hello, my name is Betsy Hernandez. I attend, I'm an undergrad in CUNY Hunter College. Um, you partially answered one of my questions. Mm -hmm. uh, the other question I had do, was, do you have another candidate, other candidates that you're uh, following for your work? Uh, I've been on the lookout. <laughs> Uh, for a number of years, so it's no s surprise that I eventually come up with one. Uh, and we continue uh, to uh, look through existing catalogs or to follow up catalogs. We're systematically going through all other objects, for example, from the Kepler data set, which is where we got this one from, uh, that m could possibly be, uh, have this same signature and uh, one by one, uh, using follow-up data, now it's three years since Kepler ended is a good time, you see, to double the baseline and really answer the question. Three years by itself isn't enough. Um, so far, we've been able to rule out every other object that we've looked at, which is no surprise, but we're going to keep looking. <laughs> okay, we have a couple in the back here. Start with Ramin and then go back to John. Um, I'm Ramin Skiba, uh, freelance. I have a question for Laurie Allen. Um, I was wondering, do you know of, pl of cities that are making lighting changes that uh, aren't near major observatories? Are, are uh, the effects on, on the he health of wildlife and humans <laughs> enough to sway people? Uh, oh, let's see. It's on. It's on. Yeah, okay. Yes, um, so yes, in major, in, in, so the conversions are being done uh, for street lights in all major cities, whether they're near observatories or not, and um, I, I, I don't know specific information city by city of the effects of the light, uh, but that's certainly um, encompassed in that recent AMA uh, report that I cited. Okay. Hi, John Wenz with Astronomy Magazine, and this question is for Julia, uh, although I guess it's interstellar light pollution. <laughs> um, but I was just wondering <laughs> if some of the, um, nice. you know, obscuring seen in the interstellar medium would affect uh, cooler or low mass objects and the ability to, to see things in our local neighborhood that might be ultra cool stars or brown dwarfs? Uh, yeah, so actually we, we kind of have an example of this in our observations. Um, we have four target stars and uh, one of them is a G star, kind of a little, uh, maybe a little older than our sun, a little fainter. And the other three are M, M dwarf stars. So they are much cooler, much fainter. Two of the targets are ninth magnitude, and one of them is 12th magnitude. And unfortunately, we've had some trouble detecting um, absorption features from the, these obscuring clouds 
in that, that 12th magnitude target. Um, it's a little difficult when the light from the star isn't super bright. Um, you need to have enough light so that you can actually see the, the spectrum of the star, and we don't really get a lot of that uh, from that particular target. The others are, are better, but um, the best targets for, uh, in particular, interstellar medium observations, if you're using spectra, would be actually really hot, bright stars. Um, it's easier to detect particular spectral features. Over here, Nadia. Um, Nadia Drake with National Geographic. Two questions for Larry. Um, the first is silly and stupid, but what color will this star actually be to earthly eyes? And the second is, if it doesn't explode, what is that telling us? Uh, well, the color was in the title. <laughs> uh, when the stars merge and explode, uh, they, they have a very distinctive uh, low temperature and hence a, a red color. And uh, yeah, only bright stars to the human eye show color. Faint stars all look gray just because of the anatomy of the eye. Uh, hopefully this will be bright enough that we'll just see it as distinctly red in a line of stars that aren't nearly as red. Um, and <laughs> I've forgotten your second question. <laughs> uh, if it doesn't explode, what does that tell us? Yes, if it doesn't explode, what does it tell us? Well, it tells us that this isn't the next one that uh, <laughs> uh, will merge. But I think we've already come to the point uh, just this year that it must tell us something else interesting. One particular reason we followed up the other Kepler spacecraft uh, stars is to see how distinctive the behavior of this star is compared to those. And even if it isn't the next merging star, it is truly distinct among the thousands of close binary stars uh, in the Kepler sample in its behavior. And so there must be some other unique process going on, not as exciting as a nova that's naked eye perhaps, but exciting to an astronomer that is maybe something new that changes orbital periods. Uh, so I'll be excited actually whichever way it goes. <laughs> Do we have any questions on the webcast? Okay, well, we'll, we'll take a few from there and then if we have time, we'll come back. Uh, first question is from jo uh, Charles Choi. Uh, freelanceforspace.com. The question is for Julia Zachary. Your poster notes that there are at least two clouds along Voyager 2's line of sight, and that one of these clouds has a slightly higher electron density than the other. Can you, for a lay audience, describe in greater detail what that might mean? Also, are there any, uh, any other clouds seen along Voyager 1's line of sight? Uh. Yeah, okay, so um, we think that the difference in electron density would perhaps indicate a difference in composition or in the overall density of the cloud itself. Um, we're not quite sure exactly the structure of these clouds. They're kind of hard to observe directly. The, the typical way we observe interstellar medium clouds is, is through spectra. And um, because these stars are relatively faint, um, it's difficult to pick out um, which features might be best uh, to describe the, uh, not only the structure, but really what kind of uh, elements or ions are present within the cloud. Um, so the higher electron density could perhaps mean the cloud itself just has a higher density, or that perhaps uh, it is kind of merging with some of the other clouds around it. There's not a lot of, um, each cloud is individual, but there's a, there can be overlap, especially along certain lines of sight, and that's what we think is happening with the Voyager 2 line of sight. For Voyager 1, um, I actually just kind of determined uh, relatively recently that one target star, uh, for one target star we see two uh, interstellar medium clouds, but for the other along the same line of sight we only see one. So what uh, our interpretation of that is uh, that one cloud obviously is uh, kind of obscuring the light from one star and perhaps the same one obscures the light from the other star in addition to uh, another cloud being present. So it's a, the interstellar medium, especially the local interstellar medium, is a, um, 
fairly complex in structure, and that's something that uh, my thesis advisor and his collaborators have been working on for a number of years. Uh, it's trying to determine the kinematic structure of the uh, local interstellar medium, so how the where the clouds are, what they are shaped, how, what their shape is, their composition, how they move. Um, there's a lot of factors that go into it. Um, it's still very uh, not uh, entirely known what, what kind of stuff is going on out there. Thank you. The next question is from Govert uh, Schilling, freelance from the Netherlands. Uh, question is for Dr. Molnar. Do astronomers expect a gravitational wave signal from this merger? Oh. Yes. Good question. Unfortunately, the answer is no. <laughs> um, or at least not one that will be detectable by instrumentation that we will have in place by 2022. Uh, to have a good gravitational wave signal, you need to have massive objects. These are less massive than the ones that were discovered uh, the, last year. Um, you also need to have a very rapid uh, period. It was only a millisecond or a few milliseconds for the one that was discovered, whereas this one spirals in, we're still talking uh, time scales of hours to spiral in, much greater than the millisecond. Um, so future experiments are trying to be more sensitive to those longer time scales but uh, unfortunately, not yet. Thank you. The next question is, uh, is from Rebecca Boyle, freelance. The question is for Laurie Allen. Have you noticed an increase in astronomers becoming night sky activists? <laughs> Why is this more noticeable these days? Also, do you think scientists in general will be more activist in the next four years, more than just gathering data? The answer to that is yes, and the reason is the, uh, the, the proliferation of LEDs. Uh, this, these are, LEDs are uh, uh, energy efficient, uh, inexpensive, low maintenance uh, outdoor lighting solutions, and for all of those reasons, they're fantastic. Uh, however, uh, they have to be chosen wisely, uh, that is the the, the warmer appearing uh, lower color temperatures are much better um, and they have to be shielded. Uh, again, uh, this is now uh, uh, very easy to do and um, uh, within our reach. Uh, but, but in areas where people are not paying attention and uh, the blue light LEDs get installed, uh, the sky will get brighter, and um, there will be, uh, you know, more astronomers and more scientists uh, certainly engaging in this issue in the next few years. Thank you. Anything else? Okay. I'm actually going to ask a question uh, for Walid um, because we had Vicki Caspi on a panel on Wednesday, and she was talking about part-time pulsars, pulsars that are usually either usually, well, I guess they're usually off and then just sometimes on, but the question is that those, the samples that she showed were, were more ordinary pulsars, and I'm wondering if there's any relationship or evolutionarily or in time between the unusual object you found and the couple that she described. Um, so I, I think what we're discovering is that there's actually a spectrum of these neutron stars with pulsars that show different behavior depending on different parts of their lifetime. Mm -hmm. And so this kind of fits with that picture. And so it's actually a very nice unifying picture of pulsars that we're coming towards in our understanding. And then a quick question for Larry. You mentioned that the star will take a, f a few months, I think you said, to reach its peak. Yes. Um, and then how long will the decline be? And the reason I ask is because you know, it would be great if this all happened in midsummer when sickness <laughs> is high, but it would be terrible if it happened, you know, six months out of phase. But is, will it be of naked eye brightness for an, a long enough period that, that we're going to see it if it really does explode this way? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Let me underline that the core of the bold prediction is that it explode at all. <laughs> um, and we will know in the next couple of years uh, from our timing whether we are really on target for that. 
then the description of exactly what the explosion will look like is far more speculative. We just haven't had enough red novae to go off to say what is the typical one. It seems that uh, by comparing to those others that we do know of, both in our galaxy and some in the other galaxies, that there's a wide range of brightnesses and even a range of behaviors. So sometimes they go up, they start to come down, and then they get stuck and will stay at a certain brightness for quite some time. So we might actually hope that it uh, could last a half a year, maybe not at the very peak, but very close to that peak, so quite visible for quite a long time. Um, if it goes off and it's a little bit too faint, I'm still going to be very happy. <laughs> well, it sounds like it'll be accessible uh, to, to small telescopes and binoculars in any case. Yes. Because it already is, right at 12th magnitude. Yes. Uh, telescopically, anyway. Yeah. Okay, so it's a good amateur target. All right, well, it's 11.15, so we're going to wrap it up here. Uh, if you have more questions, uh, feel free to come forward. Hopefully, at least a few of our panelists can stick around. Uh, we have another press conference this afternoon at 2.15. It's on exoplanets and exocomets, so we look forward to having you all back here in a few hours. Thanks a lot. That was really good. That worked out very nicely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.